celebrating all this month with a special sermon series called 500 Years of Reformation. And for these five weeks of October, we are looking at the five distinctive emphases of the Lutheran Church, the five catchphrases of the Protestant Reformation, which are these. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Solus Christus, and Semper Reformanda. Word alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and always reforming. And it kind of begs the question, doesn't it, how can there be more than one? How can there be more than one alone? I mean, after all, if it's by word alone, and grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone, then none of them are really alone now, are they? It's a good point. But you see, we use the word alone in Lutheran theology much in the same way that Jesus uses the word all in his commandments. Remember that Jesus said the two greatest commandments are these, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, now, logically speaking, if we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we've got nothing left over to give to our neighbor. But clearly, that's not what Jesus means, right? He's using the word all for emphasis, and that's how we use the word alone, too. It's for emphasis in the proper place. And so in matters of authority, it is word alone. In matters of salvation, it's by grace alone. In matters of means, it's by faith alone. Our Lord and Savior and King is Christ alone. That alone puts the emphasis in the proper place. And the place we are looking at today is salvation. And the emphasis is on grace. Grace alone, sola gratia. As we heard the Apostle Paul say in our lesson today, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one should boast. And that was a lesson that Martin Luther had to learn the hard way. Now you remember that Martin Luther did not start out to be a churchman. He never thought he'd be a, a reformer, let alone the father of the Protestant faith. Martin Luther wanted to be a lawyer. But one night he found himself caught in a terrible thunderstorm. Lightning crashing all around him. In fear for his life, he cried out in terror, St. Anne, help me, and I shall become a monk. The storm passed. Luther lived. And two weeks later, Luther joined a monastery. And Luther began to lead the sword of life that everyone said would guarantee his salvation, would perfect his soul, and would be of great service and benefit to the church. We find that hard to believe, don't we? Because from our perspective today, we tend to think of monks as being these joyless recluses, devoted to lives of intense, maybe even insane discipline behind stained glass walls, barricaded from the rest of the world. But that's not how people saw monks in Luther's day. In the late Middle Ages, monks were seen as a type of professional athlete. An athlete not of the body, but of the spirit. Monks were men who dedicated their entire lives, every waking moment of their lives, to exercising their souls through discipline so that their souls would be perfect. The hours they spent in prayer every day, the days they spent in fasting every week, the years they spent in rigorous self-denial throughout their lives, all of it was designed with a single purpose in mind, and it was to bring their soul to this point of such strength, of such beauty, of such purity, that their soul was perfect. And a perfect soul could lift up many prayers to God and so bless the church. Now we find that hard to believe. So let me give you an analogy, an illustration, which might help us wrap our minds around it. You all know who this is, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, you may not know this, but Arnold Schwarzenegger pays a visit to Columbus, Ohio, every single year. And he has ever since 1970, when Arnold Schwarzenegger made the big time. He won his first world weightlifting competition in Columbus, Ohio, and that is a bronze statue of him striking the pose outside the Columbus Convention Center. And ever since then, Arnold Schwarzenegger has come back to Columbus every single year and hosted a competition. Now, in the 40-something years that he's been doing that, that competition, which is known as the Arnold, 
That competition has grown into the largest multi-sport competition in the world. Every year, 185,000 spectators come to watch 18,000 athletes compete in 70 different sports every single year. It is the largest athletic contest of its kind in the world. Who knew? I didn't, not until I moved there. But sure enough, you know, come February or, or March of every single year, the town would be absolutely flooded with some of the most extraordinary athletes you have ever seen in your life. And as you would expect from a competition named after Arnold Schwarzenegger, the main event, of course, men's bodybuilding. And the Arnold is a prestigious event. It is the second most prestigious event in the entire world in the sport of men's bodybuilding, behind only the Mr. Olympia contest. Bodybuilders come from all around the globe to compete in this every year, and these are men who have dedicated their lives to disciplining their body, exercising their body, until they are pure, perfect specimens of human muscle. Just wish they wore pants, don't you? <laughs> well, what these men are to the body, monks were to the soul. Monks dedicated their lives to discipline, to exercise, so that their souls would be pure, perfect specimens. And who better to lift up prayers to the Lord than somebody with spiritual muscles like that? Monks were considered spiritual athletes, and that was the life that Martin Luther had chosen for himself, and he excelled at it. He was a monk's monk. He quickly rose through his monastic order, and once he became famous, he was known throughout Europe as the German Hercules. And this woodcut is one of the most famous images of its day. Uh, this woodcut was copied by various artists, it was produced by various printers, it was tacked up on houses all throughout Europe in the same way that you might hang up a poster of Dak Prescott or Ezekiel Elliott today. Martin Luther, the German Hercules, the spiritual athlete, one of the best in his game, and he was. He quickly rose through the ranks of his monastic order, he won all sorts of honors and responsibility. He was tapped to go and earn a doctorate. He became a professor of Bible. And yet, for all of that, for all of his success and all of his accomplishment, Martin Luther was plagued by a fear that it wasn't enough. And no matter how strong and perfect his soul might be, he was plagued by a fear that it was never strong or perfect enough. But like one of those bodybuilders who looking into a mirror sees only flaws and imperfection and weakness, so too Martin Luther looked into the mirror of God's word and he saw only flaws and imperfection and weakness in himself. But like a professional athlete driven to excel, so Martin Luther drove himself to work harder, to work longer, to spend all night in prayer vigils, to spend days, sometimes even weeks in prayer, only to return to that mirror of God's word and find either that the problem had not gone away or that some other one had arisen to take its place, that these muscles were strong, but now this one, now this one's all out of shape. And like some of those bodybuilders, driven to attain a standard of perfection that they can never reach, who end up hating themselves and their sport, so Martin Luther end up hating himself and his sport and even his God. Because he found in God's word a standard of perfection that he could never reach no matter how hard he tried. And he came to resent a God who would hold him to that standard. Martin Luther wrote, I found myself in this situation that though I was an impeccable monk, yet I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in my conscience. And I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. And so I did not love a just or angry God 
but I hated him, and I murmured against him. And Luther's murmuring, Luther's resentment, Luther's hatred was grounded in a root common to the people of his day. You see, medieval Christians thought that the fundamental problem with the human soul is one of weakness. That the soul has been weakened by sin, but it can be strengthened. Through hard work, through discipline, through exercise, the soul can be strengthened to the point where it is pure and perfect. Everything God wants it to be, and even more, it can help other people too. But they were wrong. You see, the fundamental problem with the human soul is not that it is weakened, but that it is dead. The Apostle Paul writes in our lesson today, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit who is at work among those who are now disobedient. All of us once lived among them in our flesh, following the desires of our flesh and sins, and we were by nature children of wrath. That's what God says about us. And we find that hard to believe. We find it really hard to believe that the problem with us is that we are born dead, spiritually dead, that we live the rest of our lives that way. That the problem we have with our souls is not simply one of weakness, but that we are dead. That we are unable to do anything, make any kind of response, any kind of movement at all toward God. In fact, we are actively moving away from Him. That we are walking in our sins and trespasses, following the course of the world, following the ruler of the air, following the spirit who is at work among those who are disobedient. That we are part of a great herd of people shuffling along after Satan, headed toward destruction like so many sheep led to the slaughter. We find that hard to believe. And so we don't. We say, oh, come on, God, we're not that bad. We might be bad, but we're not that bad. And so we reject what God says about us in his word, only to find, like Martin Luther, that we can't do it on our own. And we end up hating ourselves, even hating him. And that's where Martin Luther found himself, staring into the mirror of God's word, hating what he saw there, but unable to see any way out. And then something caught his eye. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We may be dead, but God is not. He is the Lord of life. He is the living one. The one who is and who was and who is to come. The beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. We may be dead, but God is alive. And God has done something for us. God has done something which only God himself can do. He has made us alive. Just as we cannot and did not create ourselves or give birth to ourselves, so we do not and cannot recreate ourselves or give ourselves new birth because we are dead. Not just weakened, but dead. And dead men tell no tales. Dead men wear no plaid. Dead men don't do anything because they're dead. And that is us, every single one of us, before God. But God made us alive out of the great love with which he loved us. God made us alive and sent his one and only son to be born as one of us, to preach the good news to us, to teach us life in the kingdom. To show us in words and deeds who God is and what he has done for us. And we rejected him and hated him. We 
mocked him and ridiculed him. We condemned him and crucified and killed him. We buried him in the tomb, rolled the stone shut, and then we walked away. But God raised him up again. But God made him alive again. And here's the truly remarkable thing. But God has made us alive too. And God has raised us up with Him and seated us up with Him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one shall boast. God has done something. In sending his son Jesus Christ to die for us and in raising him from the dead. In giving us the word about Jesus Christ. The living and enduring word of God by which we are born again. In making that word visible and tangible to us in the waters of baptism and in the bread and wine of communion. God has done something for us and God does something for us which is wholly outside of ourselves wholly external to ourselves, something real, something objective, something only God himself can do, and the word for that is grace. The favor of God, the kindness of God, the love of God, the power of God, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one should boast, because every one of us is dead before him. Unresponsive, insensate, unable to make even the slightest movement in his direction. All we can do is receive what he gives to us freely as a gift, and we do that by faith. But even that is his work making us alive that we might somehow respond toward him. Even faith is his work, as we'll look at next week. But for now, we're looking at grace, and grace stands alone. Because it is wholly outside of us, entirely external to us, belonging only to God and to God alone. And the grace of God shows us the depth of our need. Any solution to a problem tells us something about the nature of that problem, about the seriousness, the gravity, the the character, the depth of that problem. And so, for example, a Band-Aid is good for a cut because a cut isn't all that bad, but chemotherapy is necessary for cancer because cancer is. The solution to the problem tells us something about the nature, the character, the depth, the gravity of the problem. Now ask yourself, what kind of solution is this? To send your one and only son as an innocent lamb among ravenous wolves. To abandon him in his hour of greatest need. To lay the filth of all the sins of the world upon his shoulders. To send him to die, to bury him in the grave, to send him all the way down into hell. What kind of solution is that if the problem is only one of weakness? But if the problem is that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, well then to die for our sins and to be raised from the dead for our forgiveness makes sense. And that is what God has done. But God, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of work so that no one can boast. God has done what God alone can do. And that is how we are saved.
by his grace, his grace alone, sola gratia. Amen.